Good Monday, Cougar Nation. Welcome back inside Studio C at the BYU Broadcasting Building in Provo, Utah for another edition of the Coordinator's Corner presented by JCW's The Burger Boys. It is our last scheduled episode already for the 2020 season. Coming up on today's edition, it's 9-0 for the Cougs after a 66-14 home win over North Alabama on Saturday. The Cougs the only 9-0 team in the FBS and ranked 8th in both the AP and the coaches' polls. And with us today to look back at that game and whatever might still be ahead for BYU, we have the Cougs defensive and offensive coordinators joining us. And we start with D.C. and defensive line coach Elisa Tuiaki. Hello to you, Coach. Good to be back. Thank you. Good to see you once again. And congrats on getting to uh, 9-0. and Solid win Saturday. Yeah, no, that's uh, winning games. You know, winning games is a, is a big deal, I think, in college football. And so that's uh, definitely a good win for us and moving forward to the next. Before we get into the finer points, uh, with what were you most pleased about the defensive performance on Saturday? Uh, more takeaways and stops. And we count, we count uh, stops on fourth down as takeaways. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we, we got a lot of stops as well as uh, more takeaways than we had in the past. And so that was, that was a bright spot to the day. What were you least happy with? Uh, big plays, you know, and then uh, they were able to find a couple things in the past game, but just, just a couple of the big plays in the past that um, put them in scoring position or scored. And, uh, you know, there, there, there are some technical things that, that we coach and just uh, things that we should have been better at. But, uh, you know, we'll, a, lot, a lot of things to correct when we watch film today. The offense had you up 35 nothing before UNA scored any points, and those points came late in the second quarter. So it spoiled the shutout, um, and a big third down conversion, as I recall, and a personal foul kind of set them up on that last run. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, th those are a couple of plays that we look at that just uh, should have been able to get out of it. You know, we're, <clears throat> we were in the third and long and, and just uh, played some bad technique, and then, and then the, the personal foul moved it up as well as just the next big play that we had. It was, just, it was just technique. It wasn't anything different than, or it wasn't anything out of the, the, the normal. It was just uh, the guys probably reaching a little bit uh, more than they should have to try to make a play and just instead of just doing their jobs. Credit North Alabama. They did a good job of moving the sticks. Um, they, had, they had no defense. You had no defensive three and outs in the first half, uh, one for the game. And, and that was a winless FCS team coming in, but I thought they did a decent job moving the ball. And despite scoring only seven points in each half, they, yeah, again, they, they moved the chains. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We, we watched the film together as a staff this morning, and, just, and we felt the same way. thought that they did a really good job prepping. Um, thought, you know, a lot of the, some of the stuff that we saw wasn't, uh, wasn't stuff that they did in, a, in their previous games. And so we thought that they uh, put a little extra time into the preparation, but... Uh, uh, no, de they definitely came r ready to play and thought their offense did a good job. You hit the locker room, the halftime locker room, up 42-7. Uh, to 7. Uh, They did gain a decent number of yards in the first half, but again, it's all about points, and you allowed seven in the first half. Uh, what were maybe uh, the defensive talking points as you as coaches and players got together uh, in the halftime locker room? It was, it was uh, doing your job and, and tackling. You know, those were the, the biggest things. Is, the, the couple of uh, the couple of plays that we ended up giving up and some of the the, uh, the, dr the plays that they got just to extend drives and just you know get a first down and all that stuff it was really just guys kind of uh, overreaching trying to do somebody else's job or, or you know, everybody thinks that they're gonna they're gonna make the play but you got to trust the guy next to you and do your job and just keep the, the, the structure of the defense sound and we had uh, we had just a couple of breakdowns that we needed to make sure they were good, and then when we we started making our our substitutions in the middle of the second quarter and started putting the guys in a little bit more right. earlier than we normally would have, but uh, and that was the thing is when we came to halftime, it was just trying to get those guys to play well and play sound. Was that going to be the plan? Get into your bench even before halftime? Uh, you know, it wasn't, but when we started to roll, uh, you know, that was one thing that that uh, Kalani talked about when we were talking on the headset was just uh, making sure that. We got those other guys' experience. You know, great opportunity for us to get some experience as well as just keep our other guys uh, fresh and safe. When you look at how the week began in terms of prepping for an FCS all the way through the execution on Saturday, how would you rate last week? It was, it was, it was okay, you know. Um, you know, obviously you'd like to take those, those points off the board and you credit them for, for their execution, but um, definitely could have done better. And, you know, th thought we did pretty good in the run except for one play. It just came down to technique, and then a couple of those those pass plays just came down to technique. And so, um, you know, there there are some there are some bright spots with some of the guys. I mean, Malik Moore came in and 
and uh, did really well statistically. And there's some other guys that came in and do well, but uh, overall, we just uh, we got to be a little bit a little bit saltier on defense mm. and instead of giving up some of those things that we gave up. Speaking of bright spots, it was a bright sunny day. Nice to be playing football on a Saturday afternoon. And for late November, weather was pretty good for you. That, that was that was really nice. I'm I'm up in the booth, but <clears throat> on my way to the booth, it just you know felt really good. I know the the players enjoyed it and didn't. We didn't get that uh, shadow cast over the stadium until late. But it was also on their side of the ball. It was uh, I mean it was uh, it was a really good day. It's so nice. Nice right. to be playing ball. Said to break. Uh, tomorrow night, folks, it is the season premiere of BYU basketball with Mark Pope, your weekly look inside the Cougar Hoops program with the season opener now just two days away. It's live at 8.30 Eastern time tomorrow night on the BYU TV app. Coming up, Coach Tuiaki identifying this week's defensive and will also give him special teams players of the week responsibilities from that home win over in North Alabama. This is the Coordinator's Corner brought to you by JCW's, the Burger Boys. The handoff to Price on second down three, and he got it. A fumble, and the ball is loose, stripped and picked up. The Cougars race down the far sideline. 30, 20, and 10 inside the 10 for Isaiah Kafusi. The ball was knocked loose, and Kafusi took it down the far boundary, all the way inside the 10. It'll be first and goal from the six. And we are back on the coordinator's corner with BYU defensive coordinator and defensive line coach Elisa Tuiaki. BYU now 9-0 after a 66-14 home win over North Alabama on the weekend. Cougs' next scheduled game is on December 12th, home to San Diego State. So Thanksgiving week is a week off for BYU, wrapping up some loose ends from Saturday's win. It's a game BYU wins by 52 after leading by 35 at the break. The 14 points allowed uh, right in line with your season average, and it's all about the points, Coach Tuiaki, and BYU has been one of the best teams in the country this year at keeping teams out of the end zone. Yeah, that's, that's been always been the plan is, is uh, points per game is, is, is one of the bigger stats. Really, it really is the most important stat in the game of football. Um, and so, you know, the defense has been playing well, and the offense has been helping us a lot. And so with, uh, you know, with 14 points allowed, uh, again, that's, uh, it's kind of right in line with where you've been. Nothing's really gotten away from you this year. Haven't found yourself in too many shootouts. Uh, Houston comes closest, I think, but the way the offense finished that, it ended up being a pretty, being a pretty sizable margin. BYU's won seven games this year by 30 or more points. That had never happened in BYU football history until this season. Oh, didn't know that. That's, that's You'll a take a blowout, won't you? Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. You'll take wins, but uh, wins like that are always nice. And uh, we, we've talked about it a lot on this program, but uh, what can you say about an offense that puts you in such good positions so where these numbers hold up so well? Yeah, it, uh, I mean, it, it changes changes the way that you play defense. I know we've talked about it in the past, but just, uh, um, you know, when, when offenses, when opposing offenses are trying to keep up with your offense, it completely changes who they are. It makes them more predictable and just makes it a little bit easier for you on, on the defensive side to get takeaways as well as just, um, you know, all the big plays that you're looking for. And so, um, you know, early, early in the game, it's always a little bit closer. And, and uh, you know, offenses come out and they, they do the, the, the op- opposing offense comes out and they, they do their deal and you kind of find the personality of what they're trying to do. And then as soon as you start to get a little bit of a lead or a stretch, <clears throat> it, <clears throat> it completely changes and it just makes it a little bit more predictable and easy to defend teams like that. We saw earlier a rushing touchdown by North Alabama in the second quarter. Uh, that was only the third rushing touchdown allowed by BYU this season. Uh, for the game, UNA ran for only 49 yards, but they did want to throw it, and they threw for 300-plus. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the things you know, we talk about. If you're able to hold a, an opponent under 100 yards rushing, um, under 300 yards passing, but if they throw for, you know, we want to try to get one interception for every 100 yards that they get, mm. you feel pretty good about it. And so if we would have come away with three picks on a 300-yard day and still held them under 100 yards rushing, we feel, would have felt good about that. And so they you were, did get three takeaways. We got, we got three takeaways. They weren't in all in the pass, and you'd like to, uh, you know, come away with a couple more interceptions. But, uh, uh, yeah, you know, they, they, they made a couple of big plays and, and uh, scrambled around and just extended some plays and did some things to give them those yards. And, and I thought some of the schematical things that they did, I mean, we – we sat and we talked about one play specifically for a long time this morning as a defense. Mm-hmm. You just thought, you know, this is, this is some good stuff. And that's, you're starting to see more teams do it, and it's just harder to defend. And it's good stuff that comes from an FCS. Another good example that football is being played uh, at a high level, at all levels. And, and because they're not the P5s or even, you know, the G5s, they can still give you a good game, and they did. Oh, yeah, no doubt. There's, <clears throat> there's good coaching all over the place at every level. 
Um, and, you know, the RPO and just the nature of the RPO just puts a lot of strain on defenses. And, and uh, the way that you're, you're teaching your defense and the way that we're doing things has all got to be really, really in sync for us to be good just because of the RPO. Let's take a look at some national numbers right now. And BYU is the only FBS team to be ranked in the top 10 in both total offense, yardage, and scoring defense, points. Rush defense, also top 10 right now. Top 15 in takeaways. These are some solid numbers to be, uh, to be hanging your hat on right now. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good stuff. Some, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these uh, stats I'm seeing for the first time just because I, um, I, don't, I don't read them or keep up with them, but that's, that's good. We want to we continue to keep people lower in, in points, and um, I think rush defense, is, there's a direct correlation to it. And, you know, obviously, total defense, you'd, you'd like to, uh, to take some of those pass yards off the board. Um, it was the same thing that happened to us against Boise. I mean, we felt pretty good about where we were until we ended up giving up two big pass plays that mm -hmm. gave more yards than we should have. And, and, uh, but, uh, yeah, not, not bad. Not bad overall. And, you know, <laughs> parenthetically, while the defense is putting up those great numbers, so top 10 total offense, or rather top 10 total defense and top 10 scoring defense, the offense is top 10 in scoring and top 10 in yards, too. And clearly, BYU is the only team in, in the top 10 in all four of those categories. So, um, it's the it's the pure embodiment of complementary football right now. I mean, ex exemplary uh, play on on both sides of the ball. Yeah, yeah. I think I think we're both in all phases of of, of uh, the game. We're playing really well right now, and uh, you know, Cougar Nation has a lot to be happy about and proud about. The boys are playing hard, play, playing well. Before I before I put the uh, North Alabama game totally in the rear view here, you did get a start out of Zane Anderson. Uh, he got hurt in the Western Kentucky game two home games ago. Misses the Boise State game. You got him back. Uh, and we, he wasn't going to go, uh, you know, all the way or even half the way, maybe. Uh, how did you plan to play him on Saturday? How yeah, we, we just wanted to get him playing ball. Like I said, I think the previous week we, we didn't want him to miss an opportunity to play football before we had this long break, not knowing if we were going to have a game. And, uh, you know, the, the plan was to play him as long as we had to and, and uh, felt like we were at a, at a pretty good spot in the second quarter to pull him, and we did. But okay. uh, it was good to get him, get him in there and get some, get some reps. And physically, he came out of it okay too, right? Yep, yep, he was good. We pulled him. There's no reason for him to come out. Uh, Injury-wise, he was, he was looking good and, and looking confident the way that he was moving and running. Excellent. Let's get to players of the week right now. We'll start with your uh, defensive uh, player or players of the week. Who do you have? Yeah, well, you know, it was, it was hard this week. Uh, there were a lot of guys that, had some, that were bright spots, but we went with the statistical leaders this week. Um, <clears throat> you know, Isaiah... Is, is, is always having good games, and he did a really good job this week just with his sack and his, his scoop and score. You know, Keenan Peely did a really good job punching that out. And then Earl Toyoti Mariner was the other one that has been pretty quiet and, and uh, you know, had a really good backup role just the whole year and still playing, but came in with two big back-to-back uh, -back sacks that uh, was really good for us. Okay, that's your defensive players of the game. Uh, on special teams, we got those from uh, Coach Ed Lamb. And he went with his top rock being Chris Jackson, his top block, Isaiah Kofusi, and special teams players of the game for him were Ryan Rico and Jake Oldroyd, the kickers. Yeah, that's that's really that's that's a great thing to see Chris Jackson come in here. I know he's he's been working hard trying to get on all the special teams and uh, being a, being a top rock in the coverage teams is a big deal um, on our team and, and with the coverage team. So it's great, good to see him and. And obviously those other guys are almost almost like business like usual. I mean, they just <laughs> they show up and they play. And it's, it's good to see Isaiah do, do good things on defense as well as special teams. And uh, Jake and Ryan are, are uh, I mean, they're, they're huge. I mean, the, they're just the, have a punter that will get good as well as a kicker that's 10 for 10, as well as just sinking some of those longer ones. I mean, that is, you see so many teams or special teams is, is, is killing them on, on the punt team as well as missing field goals. I mean, it's, it's a... The true value to have guys like that on the team. Yeah, Ryan doesn't get used a ton, thankfully, but when you put him out there, he does his job. He's he's got a great leg. No, he's a it's an NFL leg. There's there's a no. I mean, we see so many people that come to practice and see it for the first time, and just are are amazed that he can kick like that. I mean, he's so good. And uh, ten for ten, you're right on on Jake Oldroyd. That's a ten consecutive field goal makes. That's the second longest streak in BYU football history, by the way. Mm. The only longer one's fifteen by Owen Pochman back in the day. So ten in a row is saying something. The only one of the few guys to not miss a field goal kick uh, this year in uh, in the FBS and and the long ones, right? That's that's his fourth career field goal of fifty yards or more. Uh, that was fifty three on Saturday. And again, only one other guy's got more. 50-yard plus, uh, plus field goals than, than Jake for his career. So he's yeah. up there in some pretty rare air as well. Yeah, no, that, that's cool to see Jake like that. And he's, he's battled through some injuries as well with, with uh, 
you know, not too many people know. Just you missed him for things. a game this year. We did miss him for a game yeah. with, with some with some back spasm, I believe it was. But then he he ended up uh, in the Boise week rolling rolling an ankle, and uh, you know was was questionable just whether or not it felt good about kicking. It came out there and and did a really good job. Let's also give a shout out uh, to Ryan who acts as the holder. Rico's the holder. Wasn't the holder to begin the season? There was an injury to Hayden. He brought Ryan mm-hmm. in. He's been the guy ever since. And uh, and Britt Hogan's done a great job deep snapping. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That that uh, you know those three, those guys, uh, uh, Austin Riggs as well has done a good job. We just rotate. We got two snappers. That Long we snapper trust Austin Riggs, right? Feel the good other, about yeah. him. Yep. And uh, you know those guys are are together all the time. I mean throughout the whole pra- the whole practices and everything. And so um, you know they're they're just uh, really really in sync in the way that they're. They're kicking field goals, and you know to have a guy that's that's like full time holding the ball for you, and practicing it is, is has been has been good for us. Normally, you have a quarterback or a backup, somebody who's good with the ball, but uh, to have Rico do it and be good at it has been been good. All right. As we go to break, once again, a reminder that dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads, JCW's quality and a lot of it. In Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, and now open in Harriman. More Coordinator's Corner next. Stay with us. From 53 yards, Jake Oldroyd swings a leg. And sends it through for three. Another 50-plus yarder for Jake Oldroyd. You're in the coordinator's corner. Brought to you by JCW's, the Burger Boys. There's only one 9-0 team in all of college football. That team is BYU. The Cougars ranked eighth in both major polls now. Heading into a bit of a break. Uh, the break could be all the way until December 12th. Home to San Diego State. We'll see if something occurs between now and then. Visiting with BYU defensive coordinator and defensive line coach, Elisa Tuiaki. And coach Tuiaki getting to 10 games, if it's just 10, that's kind of an accomplishment in, in and of itself, the way that uh, things are going around the country these days. Yeah, I mean... <clears throat> we're talking about it this morning. Just uh, you know, when when everything started in fall camp, we were we we didn't have a schedule, and then we were sitting there preparing for Utah, and then then uh, there was some buzz about us playing Alabama, and so we started breaking down Alabama film, and then and then there was uh, you know the Navy, and there's just so many different things that were going on. And then it was like, hey, there's a chance that we get into the Big 12, so we started watching you know Texas, <laughs> Oklahoma, and so. It's just uh, where we're, to, to get to where we're at now and have 10 games is, is a success. And you know, credit Tom, Tom uh, for getting us a schedule and, and for these teams for playing us and just uh, kind of moving life along. It's, it's been good. So the target date now is December 12th, but you've also kind of got to be ready for the unexpected this year. That's kind of how it's looked around the, around the country. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's, you know, there's been a lot of talk about us uh, possibly playing this week or next week. And, and uh, we'll let Tom do his job to try to find that out, and we'll just continue to prep and get the boys ready for whatever comes. Personnel notes. Uh, we mentioned uh, Zane Anderson in the North Alabama game, getting him back. Still didn't, I haven't seen Tyler Batty in a few weeks. Is the hope, uh, let's say San Diego State is the next time you play, uh, could you have him back by then? Yeah, that, that was the plan with Tyler. Is, uh, you know, we, it, it, a little bit different for a D lineman that's, that's taken on, um, you know, taken on force in, on every single play. And so didn't want him to tweak it and, and uh, wanted to make sure that he was uh, confident and, and good coming back. You were down Tyler. You were down Bracken. Uh, Al Bakri, would, would Bracken be a guy you hope to get back as well for your next game? Bracken will be back. He was, he was out for some COVID measures, and he's, he's doing well now and, and uh, ready to go. I mean, he was actually asymptomatic, just a guy that tested and, and uh, had to sit out the whole week, but uh, he'll be back. Okay, uh, Earl Tuioti Mariner, or Earl Mariner, I'm not sure if he uses the Tuioti or not anymore. Back-to-back sacks for him in the game on Saturday. Fun to see. Yeah, that, that was fun to see. I mean, he's, he's, uh, he, he's had some plays this year, just done a really good job coming in. I mean, we're, um, you know, he, his forte is in the pass rush and does a really good job with that. And so trying to get him into those moments to, to take advantage of just what he's good at or better at has been good. But he's come in and been a solid player for us and rotates and, and uh, I mean, to see him come and, and make two big plays back to back like that was huge, huge for him, and really, really happy for him. To, you know the success that he had in those games, in those uh, plays as well as just the rest of the game. So, what's your advice for the guy calling the games on the radio? Should I just go Earl Mariner or uh, or go the full thing? What do you think? I think you just got to give him the whole thing. I've been going. I've been saying Earl Tuioti Mariner on the air. Is that yeah, what I should well, be doing? You say it so well. I think if it's somebody who struggles with it, just say it Earl Mariner. <laughs> but I think but I can keep that in there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, keep, keep it in there. You say it better than I do. <laughs> no, hardly. Uh, social media questions now for Coach uh, Tuiaki. This from Brady. Uh, Brady asks, assuming no games get added, how do you keep your players sharp 
when they have such a long break ahead? You know, it's uh, we we've talked about that, and I know Kalani's got a plan uh, just to just to keep us playing football. You know, um, one of the things that we've talked about was possibly um, scrimmaging. You know, just a little bit more amped up of a scrimmage instead of just normal practices, and um, allowing some of our young players to get some some time and scrimmages and and uh, doing that. But I mean, we've we've got to be playing ball against each other. You know, the the one offense against the one defense, just to, just to stay sharp as well as uh, get good looks against each other, or else you you start uh, losing some of the skills that you have. This is a holiday week, and we're supposed to be uh, obeying certain mandates relative to sizes of gatherings and whatnot, but a Thanksgiving week does allow players to, to take a bit of a, a mental respite and, and enjoy the season a little bit too, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, assuming that nothing happens this week for us and our schedule, um, it'll give our players a chance to, to kind of get fresh and go back home and recharge, and as well as the, the coaches to just be with family and and uh, enjoy life. Uh, what's your preferred uh, menu item on Thanksgiving Day? You know, I uh, Polynesians just the, you know the turkey wasn't really a big deal. It's kind of you, you eat you eat Polynesian Tongan food, and so um, Lou, you know what Lou is? Mm. Lou, oh, it's it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's not a spinach, but it's a leaf, and you basically um, you cook it with meat inside. You put coconut milk in it, and you you put it underground, or you bake it in the oven, and, and that comes out. And so. Um, mutton, mutton and loo, that's basically, okay. loo sipi is what you call it. That's uh, loo sipi with some kumala. I think kumala would be something similar to a sweet potato or a okay. yam, yeah. I learn stuff on this program every week <laughs> when you're on. Uh, from BYU Texan on social media, uh, how long does it take you to recognize when in-game adjustments need to be made? How early into a game, maybe? Uh, it's it's uh, from play one, I mean, right out the gate. Right out the gate, the coaches are talking about um, you know, I think I think the the most challenging thing is not overreacting because there's always you know when you give a, you give something up, attributing attributing the wrong thing at the wrong time could hurt you, and so that's you know I th I think that our coaching staff does a really good job of just talking through saying you know what this is a little bit more technical than it was a scheme thing or hey this guy needs to just be reminded of his eyes or doing this but um, not overreacting I think has has been, has been one of the uh, probably more of the positive things for us and and. Uh, but but there's there's always there's always communication and chatter going on and sometimes you have to tell everybody to be quiet so you can hear you know somebody saying something but it's it's uh, I mean you got all different position coaches talking about their position and a guy brings up something if I bring up something that has to do with the safeties then I'm kind of going back and forth with the safeties coach but uh, Ed Lamb who's a you know secondary uh, you know that's that's his deal has been been in the secondary he's going to chime in too Kalani's going to chime in and so. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's always talk going on, but that's going to be one of the biggest things, not overreacting and just making sure that uh, the, the structure of it is all sound and, and we're not uh, changing too much because I think you start running into a lot of problems. You start changing things that aren't really the real problem. One last question from Brett Parker. On behalf of his son, Chase, who's 11, Chase says, what's it like for your kids to be the children of a BYU coach? They don't, they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> They don't, they don't know it's anything, and that's really until just recently, now that my kids kind of know, but, uh, you know, all the way up until just recently, it's just, I'd come home and they'd say, did you win or lose? You know, just, they're, uh, I'm dad to them, and, and uh, you know, they just, they just enjoy the ride for what it is. Well, as I said off the top of the show, it's our last scheduled show, so it's our last scheduled chance to be with you. We'll see if anything changes between now uh, and uh, whatever date comes next. But if this is the end, thank you again uh, for a great season. Always wonderful having you on. Appreciate the insight. Uh, you're great, and I appreciate you coming in each week and being a part of our show. Thank you. It's, it's been great to come on and uh, talk to Cougar Nation and, and, uh, and just, just talk about ball. All right, good luck the rest of the way and go Kooks. Coming up next, offensive coordinator Jeff Grine joins the program. You're in the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. We're back for more from Studio C right after this. You're in the coordinator's corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. We're looking back at BYU's 66-14 home win over North Alabama, a win that keeps BYU ranked eighth in the AP and the coaches' polls. Uh, BYU did gain vote points in both polls after improving to 9-0. Cougs the only 9-0 team in college football. And next scheduled to play at uh, home to San Diego State on December 12th. We start the second half hour of the show. 
by saying hello to offense coordinator Jeff Grimes. Hello, Coach Grimes. Hi, right, buddy. How you doing? Doing all right. Uh, what's happening here? Lost a bet. Oh, is, it, is that really the deal? What, what, no, sort of. My wife kind of <laughs> talked me into it with a few weeks coming up before we play again. But she said, you'll have time to get it back. So we'll see. So you walk in with the mask on, because we have these masks on all the time, except for when we're on, on camera. And so I didn't know until just like almost immediately now that this happened. Yeah, I'm kind of embarrassed. I'm not, sure how, I'm not sure how I feel about it, quite I'm frankly. I'm really not either at <sighs> this point. Okay, but there is time to get it back. There's always time. Okay, so let's hope for a long postseason and we see more of it uh, in the future. All right, 66 points on Saturday. A new single game high uh, with the Sitake era. Second 52-point win of the season and a seventh win by 30-plus points. First time that's ever happened in BYU football history. So going into Saturday's game, the outcome is kind of assured. Uh, let's be honest, but how you get to the outcome is not assured. So how did you feel about how the offense performed in getting you to 66? You know, I was really pleased with the way we came out to play, um, challenged our guys with um, the, kind of the same notion we've really tried to talk about, uh, at least I have with our offensive guys all year, and that is that we're going to be the same group that shows up every Saturday. Every Saturday you're going to see the same offense on the field, regardless, regardless of the opponent. And I feel like consistency hasn't always been our, our trademark. Um, and so that's been one of the things I've really been proud of this year. I think for the most part, we've shown up and been ready to play when we've, when we've entered the stadium on game day. And I felt like this Saturday that was certainly the case. This was a defense that had not been scored on this year in the first quarter. Right. And um, uh, we challenged our guys with that. And we talked about trying to be so efficient that we have an opportunity, put ourselves in position to score every time we get the ball. With, again, regardless of who we're playing, if that's who we are, that's our goal. And so I think we took a step forwards in terms of showing that we can that we can do that and on any given Saturday. And, you know, a lot of teams honestly come out a little bit sluggish after having a week off. Um, I really I really didn't think that would be the case because of the way we practiced last week. And, you know, the I really think the professionalism and the maturity and the desire of our team is showing up right now. UNA played only a four-game season. This was their fourth and final game. But they had played two previous FBSs. They played a ranked team. Liberty wasn't ranked at the time, but Liberty went on to be ranked. They hadn't allowed more than 28 in any game, and they'd played some FBS teams. So you did well against a pretty decent defense coming in. Yeah, and one of the things that we've talked about with, with the, when you have a high-powered offense is to make use of that early and see if you can take away the hope of the opponent, if you can break their will early and put them in position where – um, they really don't think they can win after a half or maybe even a quarter, mm -hmm. maybe three quarters. If you can get to that point at any, at any point in time on game day, that's, that's a lot of fun. Was your game plan going in to play Zach for no more than two quarters? No, we don't ever go in with a specific time frame for any particular player unless there's an injury in place. And so we didn't necessarily say that we were only going to play him a certain amount of time. We, we said we'd see how the game goes. A game went well uh, for him and your guys. Since the second half at Houston, you've had Zach Wilson in the game for 37 possessions. You've scored touchdowns on 28 of those possessions. He's, uh, he's leading you as well as you could have hoped in his junior season. Yeah, uh, you know, I, we've talked about him a lot, and he deserves it all, Every, everything that's being said about him. And, um, you know, his... His play is incredibly consistent. And, you know, the one thing that I think is getting overlooked a little bit is all the numbers, the gaudy numbers that he's putting up and not putting the ball in jeopardy very often. For all the numbers that he has, both, both throwing and running and touchdowns and all of those things, with the number of times that he's put the ball in jeopardy, very, very, very minimal. And I think that shows his... His intelligence, his preparation, and his maturity. And, you know, this week I was, I was impressed with the way that he prepared, the seriousness. I said something to him after Thursday or Friday's practice. I think it was Thursday's about just the way that he approached this week. And he said, you know, it's especially important this week. Mm. And I think that, that says something about how far he's come. He was in the game for six drives, and, and he scored TDs on, on all six of them. There are turnovers, and then there are turnover-worthy plays. And sometimes players and teams get lucky when those turnover-worthy plays don't end up in turnovers. But he doesn't even have those. Like, like even just the, the notion of danger or jeopardy doesn't show up very often. Yeah, that, yeah, that's really what I'm saying, because some guys may only have, 
three interceptions, but they could have had eight, you know, and, and that really hasn't been the case much with, with Zach. And, and I'll give a lot of other people credit along with that. His, his offensive line is giving him protection along with the tight ends and running backs that are involved with, with protection at times. And so he's, he's not having to make tough decisions in the pocket a lot. Um, and then when he throws up those those contested balls, he has a lot of confidence and he's putting them in the right spot, but receivers are going up and making plays on them as well. And so there's a lot of credit to go all around, um, but it certainly starts with him. And, and I can't say enough, not only about his play, but just his, his maturity and, and his humility this year. You alluded a moment ago to the notion of consistency and making that a hallmark. And since the second half at Houston, I'll go back to that game. BYU scored in 18 consecutive quarters. And for the season, you've been kept off the scoreboard only two times in 36 quarters. You score in 34 of 36 quarters. Um, that's, the, uh, uh, that's the epitome of consistency. Yeah, we should have scored in two more quarters, and then we'd be saying that was 100%. No, we have been. The, the consistency is really important, and it's, it's something that we've been striving towards since I've been here. And it's, we can still get better, but it's fun to see us getting to where we are now. I think it's first quarter against UTSA and second quarter against Houston. I think there's only, only two with a zero for you out of the entire season. Remarkable stuff. All right, against UNA, six drives, six touchdowns in the first half. Third straight game, you've had at least a streak of five touchdowns in five drives. And this one goes six straight, and that tied uh, a Sitake era record from the uh, 2018 Potato Bowl. Second half of that game, um, six straight drives, six straight touchdowns. So basically, it was a perfect half on Saturday. And um, did you look at it that way? Did you say, yeah, we picked the perfect game in the first half, or not the way you look at it? No, certainly not. <laughs> certainly not. I've watched the game a couple of times already and, and, um, and been angry a few times at some of the mistakes that I saw because there's still, there's still a lot of room for us to improve. And, you know, the, the thing that I think an ultimate competitor is doing in any situation is not looking at the scoreboard, but he's really competing against himself. And so every player, whether it's Zach or... James Empey or Tyler Algier or Gunner or Dax or any of our any of our guys aren't just saying, look how many plays I made. I think those guys are saying I still could have played better and I wish I had these seven plays to do again. And if you're really, truly competing against yourself to be the best version of yourself you possibly can be, that's how you really, I think, become excellent. And, and that's what we're pushing towards and, and still excited that we got a lot of room for growth. In his one half of play on Saturday, Zach threw the ball just 16 times, but he completes 10 of them for four touchdowns, no picks. So it's another huge pass efficiency day. He's now up to 26 touchdowns, two interceptions. A 13-to-1 ratio will do nicely. Uh, not only is he not throwing the picks, but uh, the productivity through the air and getting into the end zone is remarkable right now. Yeah. I, the numbers, that when you look at the the big plays that we're having especially, which is something that, we didn't have much at all my first year here. Last year, we really made an emphasis of it, I think, um, in, our, in our design of our offense. And, and um, I thought A-Rod and Fessy did a great job last year putting us, putting us in position to attack a little bit more down the field in the passing game and did a great job coaching um, to create those opportunities. Steve as well with the tight ends, M Matt last year. And then this year, we've taken that next step and even gone well beyond that. And so... I think what we've learned as a staff is the more we attack, the, the more points we'll score. And so we, we put our guys in position to, to uh, make big plays, and they just keep rewarding us. Another next step stat has been red zone. Uh, going back to the Houston game again, you scored on 26 straight red zone possessions. And of the 26 scores, 24 are touchdowns. Uh, you lead the country in red zone drives, red zone scores, and red zone touchdowns. It's a reversal of fortune from last year for you. <laughs> Yeah, that's rewarding to see because we have we have put a lot of time and energy into that as a staff. And um, but I think it's I think we've talked about this before, but I think the red zone is really indicative of who we are as a team right now. Um, we're we're balanced. Uh, we're able to run it or throw it in any situation. And when you're in the red zone, you I think you have to be able to run the football because the the field is condensed. And the secondary doesn't have to back up and cover as much grass. And then when you do throw it, you're throwing into tighter windows and you have to have guys who can go up and make plays, um, plays like Isaac did on Saturday. You know, when you're in one-on-one -on -one coverage and there, there um, isn't a lot of space, 
you have um, about that much room for error. And in a lot of cases, we're still making those plays in the passing game. And that's just where I'm going next. The fact that it is harder in a lot of ways to throw down there makes Zach Wilson's pass efficiency of 248 in the red zone just crazy. Um, and one of his favorite targets inside the 20 is Isaac Rex. Two more red zone touchdown grabs for Isaac against North Alabama on Saturday. Yeah, hard, hard to cover. <laughs> he is, he's so long um, and has great ball skills. It's, it's kind of unusual for a guy with his size to feel as comfortable as he does moving in space and timing his jump and being able to go up and get the football and could have had another touchdown right there, very close. Now this um, comes on a fourth and three, right? Yeah, it was. And Or fourth and goal from the three. Yeah. yeah. Again, you know, you just talk about, okay, who are, who are our playmakers and who can make a play if they decide to, to man us up in that situation? And so we put ourselves often in situations where we have an either-or scenario for Zach. We have sort of a concept throw on one side and then we have a matchup throw on another side where we like a one-on-one matchup and if they decide to play man and give us one-on-one there then he has the option to throw there if they double that guy or play us in a softer zone coverage then we have a concept that's designed to beat that zone coverage and in that situation he saw the matchup and made a great throw and Isaac made the catch. He leads the country in tight end touchdown catches and he's doing it on less than three catches a game. By the time he's a senior uh, they won't be doing three catches a game. Maybe a little. <laughs> no, I don't think so. But, <laughs> you know, you, you could you could certainly make a case for throwing him the ball more. But do you throw it to Gunner less? Do you yeah, exactly. Throw it to Dax or, or, or Neil or any number of guys less? Everyone's getting fed, though, right now. Every, everybody's getting touches. And, you know, our offense has always been one that's predicated on giving what the defense, taking what the defense gives us. And we're never going to force the issue. We're certainly going to try to target our playmakers. Um, but when you have enough playmakers at the various positions that we do, then we're going to put people in position where um, they have to make a decision on what they're going to give to us. It's good to be the OC with a team like this. <laughs> it certainly is. Good players make good coaches. We'll take a break. And remember, with a BYU's win on Saturday, if you live in Utah, you can get 50% off pizza today only using the promo code BYU50 at papajohns.com. When we come back, Offensive coordinator Jeff Grimes giving us Avanza's Offensive Player of the Week as we continue on the Coordinator's Corner. Brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. A little scoop to Fonua. The 15, the 10, the 5. He's going in. Touchdown. Kavika Fonua with his first career score. And it was a two-touchdown day for Kavika. So, too, uh, Miles Davis, a couple scores. By Isaac Rex, a couple touchdowns. We're back on the coordinator's corner looking back on how BYU got to 9-0 on the season. 66-14 home win over FCS foe North Alabama. BYU scheduled to be off until the next scheduled game against San Diego State on December 12th, visiting with offense coordinator Jeff Grimes. And mentioned San Diego State. We learned yesterday that their game at Fresno State for this week gets canceled. Uh, it underscores just how tough it is in a lot of ways, to just get games played uh, these days. To get to 9-0 and this year, I think it's saying something. Yeah, for sure. It's a, it's a tribute to a lot of people. Obviously, first to, to Tom and our administration for being willing to set up the schedule that they have, to Kalani and our medical staff for managing our team in, in such a way that it's given us an opportunity to play, and then, and then as much as anything to our players for being willing to make sacrifices and take care of themselves and put themselves in position where... They um, may not do a lot of the things that they would normally do in order to give us an opportunity to be where we are. We'll see tomorrow what the uh, CFP Selection Committee thinks of BYU's 9-0 record. What has this team shown you in going undefeated through November? Well, I think the, the consistency thing that we were talking about before is, is, is really what, what stuck out to me more than anything else. You know, we can only play the games that were scheduled and we're you know, I'm certainly happy to play whoever whoever they put in front of us on on any given Saturday, um, but I I think our team has shown that we'll that we'll show up and we'll play with whoever you put on our schedule, and um, I do think we're a team that can play with anyone, and and I, I I hope we'll have the opportunity to show that as we go down the stretch here. Back to Saturday, you pulled Zach Wilson at halftime. Uh, you played three QBs on the day. You scored in every quarter. Didn't turn the ball over. Second straight game with zero turnovers. You scored touchdowns every time you were in the red zone. So was there anything you thought needed attention when you were like walking off the field on Saturday or even in film review? 
Well, I think there are always little things you can do a little bit better. You know, the depth of a route, um, a quarterback's decision on on uh, which side he th should have thrown the ball to, um, a lineman's angle on a block, uh, hand placement on a release. You know, there are always little things like that that you can improve. So, not not any um, any one particular thing that stuck out more than anything. Just a number of of little details that we can that we can still improve with. But the fact that we didn't turn the football over and we only had one offensive penalty is something that really, that really pleases me. I've been on teams before where you have a high-powered explosive offense and you can make up for those things. And so they get, they get lost a little bit, those details do. And I, I don't want to bypass those because they mean a lot to me. And it says a, a, a great deal about the maturity and reliability of our kids. So basically you played clean for the most part. On we Saturday. did. Yeah. We did consistently. Uh, only two punts on the day for BYU. Uh, only one look at a field goal, and Jake Oldroyd drills it from 53 yards. Uh, so how nice to have a guy that you can count on for points. Once you get to the 35, you've got a pretty good feel you're going to score one way or the other. Yeah, just just another part of our game that, that, that shows how multifaceted we are as a team. You know, we don't, we don't have to punt a lot, but when we do, we've got a good punt team. We don't have to kick a lot of field goals, but when we do, we make them, you know? So, yeah, it's cool. A lot of fun. Offensive players of the week time now. Who have you got? Uh, a lot of people that this could have given, uh, been given to, obviously, but a couple of offensive linemen that I thought just played exceptionally, maybe, maybe their best games. Clark Barrington just uh, played like a madman. He, 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 at times it looked like it was a uh, a WWE event out there with him in the left side A or B gap, just just mauling people, playing physical, graded out over 90 percent, and and I think he had 12 knockdowns on the day. That's really hard to do. I mean, to take another man, another large man, and put him on the ground against his will is not an easy thing to do. And 12 of those is a lot. And Chandon Herring probably played his his best. I think he graded out at 94 percent, had several knockdowns himself, and I thought he played with tremendous effort and energy all day long. And uh, with with the accolades that so many skill guys have gotten, and then with the attention that James and Brady have gotten, again, all warranted. Right. Uh, these two guys have, have flown under the radar at times this year, and I just really appreciate the way that they come to work every day, the way that they play. And this was not one of those things where we said, ah, oh, we haven't given it to these guys yet. Let's give it to them. They earned it and, um, and just really love the, the, the grit and the toughness that these two guys possess. So sometimes it comes through grading. You review it and you go, yeah. Oh, sometimes it comes through the eye test as you're in it live. Now, you've got a lot going on live in game, but are you seeing this as it's happening like, my gosh, it just, sometimes, yeah. sometimes I am, and I kind of, I kind of had that, that feeling uh, that those two guys were playing particularly well. But we had a lot of guys that were playing well, and so it, yeah. it would have been hard for me to say that until I actually got together with the staff and talked to Coach Mateos about the specific grades. Um, but yeah, I, I saw some of the carnage that was taking the place carnage. out there live. Mad Men Incorporated. All right, uh, coming up after the break, uh, Coach Grimes will take some of your questions from social media. As we continue in the Coordinator's Corner, we're brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Back with more right after this. The Coordinator's Corner on BYU TV is brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. BYU Food to Go, the MVP of your next event. Siegfried and Jensen. Serving Utah families for over 25 years. BYU now 9-0, resting up for whatever comes next. Right now, it's a December 12th home game against San Diego State. We're in Studio C with OC Jeff Grimes. Uh, so much well-deserved attention going the way of Zach Wilson right now, but something else is percolating in the program, and it goes back to something we talked about before the season, and that's having go-to guys, uh, big number guys. Wilson's numbers speak for themselves. They're Heisman caliber, but you also need big seasons elsewhere. And right now, you've got Tyler Algier and Dax Milne pacing to become BYU's first 1,000-yard rushing and 1,000-yard receiving duo in 12 years. Hmm. That's cool. And something else that I've talked about a lot since I've, since I've taken this job is that I wanted to have a balanced offense, you know, and um, some people like running the ball more. Some people, a lot of people like throwing the ball more, but I think they both work well. They both work best when they work hand in hand. And I think a big part of our, our ability to um, 
run the football this year has been because teams know Zach can throw it over their head. And uh, I think a lot of the reason that, that Zach's been able to be efficient in the passing game to Dax and other guys is is because they know that we can run the football. And I said, so I think the balance has been a big part of it. Certainly these two guys are um, deserving of any uh, praise that's coming their way. And uh, you've also got, uh, you know, Gunner not too far behind Dax and Neil Pau who continues to make plays as he did again on Saturday. Great stuff from the wide receiver crew and the balance is there displayed. Social media questions. Uh, question coming in from Marin Wilcox for you, Jeff. Are we going to see more passes to Mason Wake? She misses his hurdles. <laughs> well, I don't necessarily miss Mason's hurdles. Sometimes <laughs> those are good. Sometimes they're not. But, you know, as we talked about earlier, um, we... We take what the defense gives us, and we had a couple of opportunities the other day where Mason was involved in some passing plays, and the defense covered him and didn't cover somebody else. And so he'll continue to get opportunities like everybody. Brett Parker asked a question of Coach Tuiaki from one of his sons, Chase, in the first half hour. Second son, Ethan, gets in in this half hour. Ethan's 13 and asks, what are the specific strengths you see in Tyler Algier and Lopini Katoa? Tyler is, is a, an unusual combination of size and power and speed and agility. You, you just do not see a lot of guys that are as strong as he is, um, that, are as, that are as agile as he is, and have the ability to, to make the breakaway run like he does. Uh, Peeney, I think his greatest strengths are uh, uh, spatial awareness, the ability to make cuts in space, his vision, and just tremendous hands. Great receiver out of the backfield. And, Two different type of backs, but both very capable. Okay, from L.J. Pearson, who says, Last year, a special offensive package for goal line short yardage was introduced with a mix of offensive and defensive players, such as Kyrus Tonga, Austin Kofensis. They had good success with that. Why has the package not been around for you this year? Uh, we've just chosen to go a different route this year. I think we have enough offensive players that we haven't had to utilize defensive guys, and we want to keep Zach Wilson and Isaac Rex and some of our playmakers on the field as often as we can. Not a bad option. Uh, maybe a 30-second answer on this one, if not less, as we get toward the end from Brady, who asked it of Coach Tuiaki as well. Assuming no games get added, how do you keep your players sharp when they have a long break between games? Challenge them. We challenge them to stay physically and mentally active, and we challenge them to get better every day. Everything that I've challenged these guys with since I've been here for three years, they've been willing to meet. Fantastic. And that will do it for not only today's show, but unless something changes, that'll be our season of Coordinator's Corner for this year. So it's been a wonderful year with you once again. I appreciate uh, the things you teach me week to week on this show and in the games. Uh, congratulations to you and the boys for a great season. We hope it continues as long as possible. Thanks so much. I uh, always learn a lot from you as well, Greg. It's been a lot of fun. Let's keep it rolling. Thanks, Jeff. All right. That will do it for this week's edition and this season of the coordinator's corner for coaches Eli Satuiaki, Jeff Grimes, and Ed Lamb, who wasn't with us today. My name is Greg Rubel. Thank you for being with us. Have a great week and go Cougs. <laughs>